I'm super excited to have Dr. Jonathan Nebel here with us to talk about union. And thanks so much for donating your time to us today. So Dr. Nebel, we see the word union on buildings. We hear the word union used a lot. Here are some examples, a student union, a holy union, a, a workers union, a family reunion. What do all these unions have in common? What what exactly do usually we mean when we say union? Yeah, so it's a big concept. And it's part of the reason why philosophers love wrestling with it so much. Uh, and the big idea, the main thing that Craig combines well is that it's something supposed to be where multiple things are coming together to be one thing. This is the famous puzzle of the one and the many. How can there be many things um, continue to be multiple while at the same time being one thing? Uh, and there are many ways philosophers talk about this puzzle, um, but that's the basic idea. How in the world do we get many things to become one um, so that they're truly united or truly in union? So that's that's the basic idea of what union is. Okay, excellent. And you have a super interesting idea about why the typical way we think about unions doesn't actually apply to persons in union. Can you tell us more about union when you're talking about two people? Yeah, so a lot of the ways philosophers talk about union between things um, ends up not being very applicable when talking about the nature of union and love or how persons come to be united. So philosophers use different ideas such as uh, the union between matter and form, forming a substantial union. Um, this, what is that? Sort of, Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. I didn't quite yeah. know that. So, I mean, so this is an idea that comes, you know, all the way back from Aristotle previous that gets really picked up in the medieval times with the idea that uh, a substance or a thing is made up of its form, uh, which is in some sense, you know, there, there's, this is a huge philosophical debate that we can fall into, but something about sort of like the way in which it's structured or something like that. And it's, uh, and it's matter, the actual things that it's made up of. So your house is not just the materials, the bricks that it's formed of, but also sort of the structure, the way in which your house is built. Uh, and that in some sense, the house is this union between the matter, the bricks, and the form, the sort of structure that's on the blueprint or something like this. And so um, we can talk about unions in this way, but this obviously isn't what union and love looks like because typically it's thought that persons are full substances in themselves. Each person is made up of matter and form. So that philosophical tool we can't use. And on down the line, all of these different sort of interesting philosophical tools, the way that philosophers like to talk about things coming into union seem to not apply to persons in union. And the main problem is this, is that most discussion of things coming into union that philosophers talk about involve these kind of part whole relationships where you have sort of the parts of the house coming to form some whole a house. But when you have two persons coming to be united in love, you in some sense have two wholes coming together into union and forming a new whole, but they're not just mere parts of this new unity that they've created. That when someone is united to another person, they don't become merely a part of the other person, or they don't become merely a part of some larger whole or something like this. They continue to be a full-fledged substance or whole thing in and of themselves. And so this is the weird and unique puzzle of uniting persons in love is that you need them to both be united and distinct at the same time. They somehow need to be one and two simultaneously. And that on the face of it is just a sheer contradiction. It's just absurd. Uh, and so uh, that's the puzzle that I think is really exciting when trying to figure out how in the world persons are united in love. And you have a super cool way of explaining one way to resolve the apparent contradiction. So can you tell us more about how you see there being an actually plausible explanation for this problem? Yeah, so the way I try to solve it on my view is to try and examine the nature of the self. So I begin by looking at some uh, examples of union between persons 
and showing that, look, this can't be what union and love looks like. So when we see the, the Borg collective in Star Trek, we see a certain kind of union between the person. They're all united in this hive mind. Everyone's a decision is affected by everyone else's decision. And there's this deep union in their purpose and their goals. But obviously this isn't what loving union looks like. And there are many other cases like this where you seem to have people coming together for some purpose or something like this, but this can't be what union and love looks like. What I argue sort of in brief outline is I argue that we need to look at the nature of the self. And specifically, I look at two conceptions of the nature of the self. So one being this experiential self. This is an idea that comes from Dan Zahavi and some others. And the basic idea of the experiential self um, is this. He says, for any experience that you have, your experience is given to you, or something like this. That every experience requires an experiencer. So the other way he gets at it is he says, look, when you imagine different experiences that you've had, he says, sort of um, seeing an apple or remembering a banana or um, these kinds, different kinds of experiences we can have. He says they can differ in different ways, but they're all very similar in one important way, which is that all your experiences are for you. That experiences are given to you as an individual. And so in this way, this, he thinks, grounds a certain sense of self that he calls the experiential self. And I argue that this experiential self grounds your identity, that, or your individuality, your uniqueness, that even in the most tight-knit kind of union and love, um, your experiential self can in no way be united with another, that you're always going to be a unique person with your own unique experiences, because so your experience can only be given to you. But we also have this other exciting account of, this, of the self, which is this narrative self. And I argue that, that the narrative self is where persons can be united in love. The two persons can unite their narratives in some unique way in which they tell each other's stories or they begin to allow another person to write the story of their own lives and that person can write their story. And this sort of mutual co-writing of each other's narratives um, allows a certain type of union in the narrative self. And allowing for us to be united via the narrative self, but continue to be individuals through the experiential self, allows us to capture this kind of paradoxical sense in which we're both united and distinct at the same time. Excellent. And I'm sure you have a perfectly good explanation to this next question. So I'm not posing it as uh, an objection, but more so inviting you to clarify something I'm probably just confused about. How is it that if two people unionize, they are at the same time distinct through their experiential self, and yet one, and therefore not distinct, through their narrative self, and yet they haven't unionized wholly because they haven't put together their their experiential self so how how can we have two people not unionizing through some part of them and yet saying that they really are in a substantial uh, sense union um how can they be one and yet at the same time, they didn't put themselves as joint in every possible way because yet their experiential self is not the part of themselves that unionizes. Did I get that question out correctly? Yeah, good. So maybe, me. Yeah, so I think there might be two potential puzzles you're raising from my view. Okay. So, so I think maybe you're pressing on more of this first so much, I think, which is that how can we truly say, so So in my work, the, the case I look at the most is the case of David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel, uh, these two dear friends who come deeply, uh, become deeply united. Can you tell uh, us the story, example, one, just in case we haven't heard it? Yeah, sorry, so I can tell us, so so, so uh, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, um, we have the story of David and Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of King Saul, the um, reigning king of Israel at that time. Uh, but Jonathan has been, or sorry, but David has been anointed as the next king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. Uh, and they begin to form a kind of deep friendship. Uh, and so much so that in 
1 Samuel 18, it says that uh, their souls have been knit together. And that phrase sort of really sort of pushes forward a lot of, a lot of my work. Um, so you may think, here's one way to talk about the puzzle is you might be worried that we can't truly say that David and Jonathan are united in love because there's still a part of them that's distinct or something like this. Yeah. How can we really say that they're united if their experiential selves are still distinct? Yes, that's my question. Okay, good. So what do I want to say? So going back to sort of the original view, maybe it's helpful to put this out, what, um, where this idea of union and love comes from. So I take this from Thomas Aquinas, who argues that love involves two desires, a desire for union with the beloved, but also a desire for the good of the beloved. And what I think is the case is this, is that it is good for individuals to still be their, distinct, their own distinct individuals, to in some sense still have their own capacities, to still have their own intellects, and still have their own wills, um, that it's not good for you to just become merely a part of another person. In cases like the Board Collective, um, or cases like uh, in Robert Heinlein's book, The Puppet Masters, which talks about these sort of alien slugs that uh, land on Earth and overtake humans by sort of landing on their spinal cords and basically taking over as like a parasite. So they sort of attach to you and take over, like basically mind control you. So okay, and, so and that wouldn't be good for you. Yeah, you, it'd be good for you to have your own will. Right, okay, I'm with you. Yes, yeah, so you could see that um, the person who's been taken over by the slug. So, say you know one of these slugs lands on me and you know mind controls me. Me and the slug would be in a deep form of union. Sort of everything that the slug decides, I decide. Everything that the slug sees, I sees. All of our senses are one. Our will is one. But we can see, obviously, this is not union and love. I've been taken over. I've been oppressed or sort of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, subjugated in some way. Um, but you can see what's happened here is um, our experiential selves have been united in some deep and important way. Uh, and so, and every part of us has come into union. And so it seems that uh, to truly accomplish union and love, you need to have true union, a sense in which you truly are united in some way but that complete or total union where the whole of one person and the whole of another person just become one thing is not really good for either person because it's still good for them to be distinct. So that union and love requires a certain amount of distinctness between the persons. And so that's why the distinctness needs to continue to be there. So that's what, so if that's the puzzle you think, the second potential yeah, way- what do you think I was gonna <laughs> say? What, 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 so that does answer my actual question, but what's the other thing I might have been asking? Yeah, so the second puzzle I thought you might have been getting at, which I talk about some of my work is, well, okay, so we have the idea that David and Jonathan are unique through their uh, experiential selves and they're united through their narrative selves. Mm -hmm. But now this just seems like a straight up contradiction. We're just saying, look, they are united and they're distinct at the same time. But in other words, you're saying, mm. look, they're united and they're not united or they're distinct and they're not distinct simultaneously. And if philosophers hate anything, they hate a bare contradiction. And so um, that seems to be one potential puzzle of the view is doesn't my view just collapse into a pure contradiction of some sort? Mm, okay, that's not what I was thinking, but do you wanna offer a potential solution to that? hypothetical yeah, I can, objection. Yeah, I could say a little bit. So, okay, so maybe if you weren't going to go down this road, but I think it's helpful to, to talk about it a little bit because it illustrates, um, I think, an important part of, of the view, which is the idea that, um, so the best way to get at it maybe is to understand what I try to draw as an analogy in my work is I want to say, okay. look, we have a similar puzzle where we have to say seemingly contradictory things about one subject that end up being not actually contradictory. And the example I use, it's analogy, uh, comes from uh, the work of in Christology and how to explain that Christ, who on Christian theology is both God and man, how these seemingly contradictory characteristics about Christ can both be predicated of Christ. So for instance, Christ is mutable or he's changeable because he's a human being, he can be changed. But Christ is immutable because he is God, because he's divine or something like this. And so it seems to just be a bare contradiction. If you say, well, look, yeah, he, 
you know, Jesus is uh, immutable because he's God, but mutable because he's man, well, you're just stating a pure contradiction. But what sort of theologians and philosophers have argued is that you can um, show that these are not contradictory by saying that they might be predicated both of the same subject, that you have contradictory predicates predicated of one subject, but they're not predicated in the same respect. And oftentimes this is used with this famous sort of qua phrase that uh, Christ is mutable qua his divine or his human nature and Christ is immutable qua his divine nature. And even though these are contradictory sort of attributes or properties of Christ, they're predicated in different respects. And so they don't, we don't actually have a contradiction arise. And what I argue is that I can make the same move when mm -hmm. talking about union and love is that Jonathan and David are distinct qua their experiential selves, but they are united qua their narrative selves. And even though these are contradictory predicates or attributes of the same subjects, um, there is no contradiction here because they're predicated of them in different respects. And thus we have no sort of logical problem here. Um, excellent, excellent. And thanks for giving that uh, really good solution by analogy to the hypothetical objection. That was not where I was going. I was going with the first potential puzzle. I don't know if you can still call it a puzzle if there is a perfectly good explanation, but very well done. So I guess I have two questions at the same time, but I'll give them to you in order. First, I'm wondering, what does it tell, um, imagine that you're right, right? Just like assuming you're correct. What does that tell us about human nature? The fact that we as human beings have what it takes to unionize with other human beings and at the same time, both be ourselves and have our own rational will and narrate our lives with one another in a in a deep way in the way that that you're discussing so what does that tell what does that tell us about human nature that we even have that capacity yeah good so i think what my view tries to do is tries to explain um kind of the intuition that aristophanes is pulling at in his oh, famous what is that? uh so in his bit in the symposium, so in Plato's symposium, um, we have a number of characters come up and give these speeches about what love is. Mm -hmm. And they all give these interesting speeches, but Aristophanes is by far the most fun. And Aristophanes tells this wild tale. It might not be the right one, but it's by far, it's by far the most fantastical. It's, uh, and so he tells this fun tale uh, about how human beings originally had these sort of forearms and four legs. We all sort of like cartwheeled around. But eventually we became too powerful because we are we were these like eight limbed creatures apparently it made us too powerful and so we began to cartwheel our way up mount olympus to take over the gods and zeus in order to sort of knock us down a peg split us all in half and sort of formed us all so that instead of having two legs or four legs and four arms we now only had two legs and two arms and thus love is a desire to go out and find your literal other half in a very literal sense that you have to go find the person that you were physically separated from the past so much so that uh aristophanes you know finishes his tale by talking about how those who truly love each other would go to hephaestus the you know the greek uh blacksmith and want to be forged back together into one physical thing so i think the intuition that aristophanes is getting at and why his sort of fantastical tale seems to get at something is because we have some sense that alone, without other persons, without relations to other persons, we are in some sense incomplete. Mm. That in order to fulfill who we truly are, who our nature, what our nature requires of us in some sense, is relationships with others. That so many of the ways that we define who we are are in relations to each other, whether it's just simply as I am the son of Keith and Debbie, or I am the husband of Michelle, or I'm the father of Aaron, or something like this. All these relational characteristics form a key part of our identities. And um, I think my view helps explain this deep intuition that in some sense, us alone, having if we were disconnected from all the human beings, our nature and our purpose or our, the natural end of man would be left incomplete or unfulfilled. And that it is through loving relationships with, with others that we truly achieve who we are meant to be. 
uh, and showing how this is possible through the narrative self helps sort of reveal that part of human nature. Okay, that is really interesting. Thank you for sharing that excellent response, but also with the story. Okay, so my last question, and I had this a moment ago, so this is a little backtracking, but it sounds like everything you're saying about your unique theory on union in love only applies between two humans or how exactly does that work is is your account of union in love an account that tells us what union is in a way that doesn't apply to student unions and and labor unions but also doesn't apply to uh, let's say a cat and an owner but can you tell us more about what you think your theory can apply to? Yeah, good. So I, so I think maybe there's two, two things I can say here. So one, so yeah, my account of union and love is going to apply specifically to, um, to those who have a narrative self and to have an experiential self. Mm. So these two are going to be necessary features of, for my account to apply. Um, Oh, I think, yeah, for like cats and dogs, um, they don't have sort of narrative selves or this sort of deeper sense of personhood that would be necessary for grounding this type of um, um, per, you know, union and love in this way. Um, but the second important point is, I think what I want to argue too is that um, I think my account of union and love provides um, a sort of sufficient conditions for which persons can be united. Mm -hmm but perhaps not necessary conditions, that we can be united with other persons, perhaps in some other way, um, but that we might be able to be united with non-persons and non-persons might be able to be united with each other in other ways as well. So examples I think of is sort of, you know, I think I, I have uh, a son who's uh, about almost 18 months old, um, but even when he was younger than that, we may think maybe at 18 months, he's developing some sense of a narrative self, but that might even be too young. You can think even at you know his first moments of life, there is this sort of deep sense that there is a deep bond between me and my son and, and between my wife and, and our son. Um, but there's no way that my account of union and love could explain this. Oh, um, okay. So there seem to be other ways in which we can be united. Mm -hmm. But I think what I wanna argue is that sort of my account explains the, the richest form of union and love uh, and then you that with, as the paradigmatic case. Yeah, something that like that. that, that okay. This my account helps explain the kind of union and love that love sort of ultimately desires, or something like this. That we okay. can be united in some lesser way and through other methods, but this the full-blooded, really exciting kind of union that love truly desires comes in this deep kind of intimate co-writing of narrative.